Welcome to um, Fall Term 2013 Counseling Psychology 195, in case you were wondering what CPSY means. This is uh, Introduction to Addictive Behavior. Uh, I'm Mark Harris, your instructor. Um, just by way of introduction, I'm uh, the Substance Abuse Prevention Coordinator, which Street Talk is Drug Counselor. I am the only, I've been working uh, in the addictions field for 40 years since my junior year in high school in Los Angeles. Um, so I'm counting my paid time doing that. Um, and um, I've been here at Lane Community College for something like 22 years and in Oregon for 30. And the only work that I've ever had in Oregon is in the addictions field. Adult treatment, kid treatment, represented the college on the gang task force, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so one of the things that I should say at the outset is addictive behavior moved beyond substance abuse about 20 to 30 years ago because there's lots of addictive behaviors and the science is kind of slow to kind of catch up to that fact. So understand uh, my approach while I, while I will um, as a faculty member, I'm allowed by the culture of academia to have an opinion. I will make a distinction between my opinion and the scientific fact wherever there is science. So I'll try and give you the science first, and then you know my opinions later or where things are still being worked out, because things are still being worked out, as an example. So I'll show you something torn from the headlines. So, Class logistics, uh, if you're viewing this on cable, uh, you have basically three options for taking the class. Um, classroom, which is basically Tuesday and Thursday, the college's code is TRR for Thursday, because Tuesday and Thursday begin with T's, right? Make a distinction. <coughs> Three to 420, no more jokes about how it's over at 420. It's like that is so old, okay? Uh, building 2, room 214, online, if you have cable, Comcast cable, it's channel 23, the educational channel, one of them, and uh, Charter 9. Uh, you also have real-time streaming as referred to in the syllabus. That means you need a computer, the URL, and that is only broadcast in real-time, i.e. now, as the class is happening, only as the class is happening, okay? After the broadcast, the broadcast is being recorded. So you are being recorded. You're, it is you, the assumption that if you're in the class on camera, you've already given your consent. That will be YouTubed, and I'll get the links for that sometime later today or tomorrow. And let's see. And then cable uh, will be rebroadcast. The cable uh, portion will be rebroadcast on Saturdays at 8 and at 9.30. So the entire week will be broadcast in that 8 to basically 8 to 11 window. In case you miss it. Right? So you have a variety of choices. Americans love their choices. Right? So online, uh, real time, however you want. Uh, Cottage Grove, of course, we have a real-time simulcast in the Cottage Grove campus, campus classroom. Uh, basically, the whole thing with the assignments can be physically turned in. As I'm, this is an order of preference. I'm old school. I like to read things in my hand, still get the register guard, but I have my iPad has the New York Times from L.A. I should get the L.A. Times, but whatever. Um, Physically turned in, email to the Harris M at Lane CC address. You can inter-campus mail them if you're in Cottage Grove, uh, or you can upload them to Moodle. Uh, Moodle, even though I voted for it, annoys me, but all those ways are acceptable. Uh, all tests, the midterm and the final, are take-home open book. Midterm goes out week six, is due back week seven. Uh, the final is week 10, and so basically whenever they go out, usually the Thursday of week 6 and week 10, they're due back in a week. 
Now, the purpose of this class, so when I've worked for the state and the feds, I train drug counselors. And so it's my opinion using the drug war nomenclature, I don't really particularly buy that it's a war exactly, but you're either paid to deal with this stuff as a professional or you're a civilian, and which means you're a target. Not to put it too bluntly, you're a target. And basically the way you are targeted is through fairly commonplace business practices. Because major sections of the American gross domestic product depend on addiction. And I'm talking about the legal side, not just the illegal side. So, it is a fact, and I'll, when I have, I'll give you a fact, I'll try and cite the source and try and hold me to this. Okay? Using the Surgeon General statistic from 2000, year 2000. Okay? So we expect people to die. Right? Death and taxes are the only things that are certain, right? But what the public health community calls excess mortality is people dying in excess of what you'd expect. Okay? So to make the list that I'm going to show you, a doctor had to sign on your death certificate that you died this way. Okay? And then I'll specify, because this is the standard, right? So, legal drugs. Every day, in the year 2000 stat, legal drugs kill more people every day than died at 9-11. And each one of those are preventable deaths. Okay? So more people died from legal drugs used the way the manufacturer intended, then died at 9-11. Now, part of that, so you could actually break it down, and you know, we also have the figure for illegal drugs, so I like to break down things in visual. So the, the technique is called social math. Right? So you take the statistic, you divide it into a Boeing airframe, i.e., 747, 727, MD-80, Gulf 6 business jet, whatever, right? So, for example, leading, to the, so it's tobacco, alcohol, prescription drugs, okay? So for, al for tobacco, this stat breaks down to three seven fully loaded 747s crashing every day. The alcohol stat is one L1011 or uh, 757 crashing every day. Prescription drugs, one 757 crashing every day. So roughly 450,000, 100,000, or about 150,000, and about 100,000. Now, this alcohol stat, oh, by the way, I should do, divide uh, the tobacco death stat. So something like, uh, let's say, one MD-80, because I did mention that, that's from passive. That is, they're not even smokers. They work in a bar or something and still allow smoking. So pe these are people dying from lung cancer, emphysema, et cetera, et cetera. The alcohol stat is from de primary disease. You got cancer, you got cirrhosis of the liver, it's not car crashes, it's not murders. That's a separate step. This is by using the drug and developing a disease from it. All right? Prescription drug, think Heath Leisure. 
Now, he nailed that role in the Joker in the Batman movie, right? Do you agree? Okay, that twisted his head. Couldn't sleep. Legitimate scripts for sleeping pills and depression, etc., etc., that interacted badly and killed him. Okay, using the drugs the way the doc no, not even an addict. Killed him. Just side effects, right? 100,000 people a year. And that's the year 2000 stat. So here we are in 2013. You think the number's gone up or down? Okay, so should I, am I paranoid in saying you're a target? Okay. So my job is made easier by arming you with information so that you don't become a target. But I wish it was just as simple as alcohol and drugs. Oh, so I got to mention the illegal drug stat, right? Now, that's tricky to get. But it works out to be about... Um, well, let me put it this way. It's two Gulf 5 business jets, about 40 people. And I had to double the stat that they had to get that. Now that's like, so for example, where this came from is the Dawn Network. Drug Abuse Warning Network, it's basically ERs, and heroin overdose, meth overdose, cocaine overdose, you died that way, the participating emergency rooms put you on a statistic. Not all ERs are in Don. So I had to take the Don stat for that year and double it to get that figure, right? Because not everybody dies in an ER from a drug overdose, right? So, yeah, how, how do you deal with that ambiguity? It's tricky. But from meth, heroin, and coke, drug overdoses, something like 40 people die every day, nationally. Do I think that figure's low? Yes. But what are you going to do? Right? So we have a constant rate for Lane County. I can, you know, do that as well. But you know, just saying, do you really need that? So obviously, the illegal drug use deaths is like 55 times lower than the legal drug. But how come we're having a war on weed? Because weed isn't even part of that stat, huh? It certainly isn't because, you know, meth users are harder to find <laughs> than drunks. <laughs> just saying. Told you I was opinionated. No, no, I'm just saying. Just look at the facts, right? So, part of the piece then, in terms of the reason the field moved beyond just simple substance abuse is because once you cure somebody of uh, cure, somebody of their addictions, they'll often dodge into gambling, or sex, or the internet, or, you know, or they'll have multiple things going all at once. You know, and so people need to be aware of, for example, their environment, and or their culture, whatever that means. So here's uh, why I selected these two books and <laughs> it's in the process of writing a book, but I haven't finished converting the class PowerPoints into the book yet. Because it's busy. Yeah, like yesterday was crazy. First day. Seven crazies before noon. <laughs> Mondays are bad, Fridays are bad, or they're dead. So. Willpower is Not Enough by Washington and Boundy is your text. Uh, Fourfold Way by Angelus Arian. Uh, this is decent f for giving a broad-based civilian-level understanding of you know, some of the issues from the 12-step point of view, from the recovery point of view. Uh, one of the things that, uh, I'm a black Indian, 
the, no, the name for our name for that is Maroon. Not like I got banned on a desert island, but no, I'm from the desert island, and we fight slavery. That's what we do specifically. And addiction is slavery. And I'm like Harriet Tubman. This is war. So sometimes the slaves don't even know that they're slaves. Oh, I just thought it was normal to be like this. Uh, no, you need to look at the dimension of culture. Now, the way we often speak in America is like, oh, ethnic minorities have culture and white people don't? B.S. But we get to own it and examine it and question it. And so here is a statistical fact. Let's go. Thanks. Being an American puts you at risk for substance abuse. Okay? If you're an immigrant, the values of your home culture, when you come here, the substance abuse patterns are low in your home culture. When you come here, they go up. That's a fact. Not my opinion. Government statistics. So one of the things we do in prevention is, okay, let's look at the values of your home culture and preserve those. Because maybe we don't want you becoming strung out, alcoholic, mouthy teenagers who tell your parents to F off. Maybe we want to teach respect for your elders and family values and hard, sober work or creativity, which is not necessarily a mainstream American value if you look at the media. Maybe we don't want to do that. Maybe we want to have a culture that is healthy, based on truth-telling, etc. So part of looking at that, so one of the things that my office does, um, Building One, Room 226, the Recovery Center, Part of our motto is recovering sobriety, because that's what we're funded to do. do deal with substance abuse and addiction-related issues, addiction-related issues, and um, recovering culture. And sometimes that means creating a culture that's alien to the one that you were raised in, especially if the one that you're raised in promotes addictions as normal. Because we don't believe that addiction is normal. So. Uh, feel free to ask questions anytime. Ask for elaboration. Come sit. All right, so the intention of the course is to arm you with knowledge, skills, and abilities to achieve a healthy, balanced, non addictive life oriented towards civilians, also known as lay people. Those who are not paid or expected to deal with addictions on a professional level of skill. Part of what we, the skills that we want to build in, so you can take these courses, this CPSY 195 and uh, CPSY 200. 200 is the professional's course. While there's no prerequisites for either one, generally speaking, professionals are expected to have resolved their issues with substances and be non-addicted. We don't ask you to pee in a bottle so we don't check that out. I've had people in the past who attended both cl classes loaded since we're on camera. I'm not going to call you out on camera because you're baked, yo. <laughs> not going to do that. Uh, but I will probably know, let's not play the cat and mouse game, you want to think about why you would come loaded to a drug addiction class. It's not cat and mouse with me, it's about you. All right? So, the, lots of civilians were taking the professional's course. They don't need the treatment level expertise and the medical terminology and all that other kind of stuff. What they do need is self-care. Unfortunately, professionals don't get self-care. They're assumed to have had that, i.e. 12-step, which... Great. If you have an addiction that 12-step doesn't cover, then what are you doing? Oh. So, that's why I like being maroon, because in our framework, 
the native recovery frameworks are 400 years old. Western medicine, I'm being charitable, is 150 years old. Chinese medicine, 4,000 years old. China went through alcohol bro prohibition 10 times in 3,000 years. Okay, so obviously making something illegal doesn't work as a prevention strategy. You just create an underground economy, right? So the recovery field is basically, we just started thinking of alcoholism and addiction as a disease in 1956. Now I was born in 54. So the addictions field is like two years younger than me. I got guitars older than that. So understand, we didn't even have a concept of how drugs work in the body until the 70s. So I'm saying the science is there, but it's new. Your question. How would you say the recovery If we count from the Wellbridey movement, the code of Handsome Lake, Handsome Lake was a Seneca spiritual leader from the 1700s who had been addicted to alcohol, cured himself, and basically said, okay, our native way of life is in danger. We didn't have fire water, though they may have had forms of ceremonial alcohol, but the native value, the natives that had alcohol, so basically in order to have alcohol technology, I'm not going off on a bird rock, I'm just giving you the context because you're adults, right? Come on, you should nod yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's you know you, the historical context, I can give that to you. All right, all you need for alcohol technology is an agricultural surplus and a climate that supports fruits going bad at room temperature, right? So Eskimos, the Inuit, don't have alcohol technology. All right? The Aztecs did. Some native tribes in the East Coast did. Elderberry wine, et cetera, et cetera. The native values around alcohol was that only for adults, only in ceremonies, no drinking to intoxication, and then various sanctions for violating that. Right? No, we don't give this to kids. Natives knew 4,000 years ago that alcohol harmed the fetus. So don't drink during pregnancy. We didn't even have the concept of fetal alcohol syndrome until 1978. Okay? So you understand why I do a cultural approach? There are some cultures that have forgotten more about prevention than we know. Okay? It's like... I'm a proud American, but let's, let's get real. 200 years, like, if 100 years of human culture is like a year of human life, America's a two-year-old. Western civilization is a 10-year-old. So, yeah, we're the greatest country in the world with cell phones and nukes, but we ain't got the maturity to know that what the Puritans didn't know is they're giving rum to four-year-olds to put them to sleep in the 1600s. Rule of thumb, you can beat your wife and children with a stick as long as it isn't thicker than your thumb. The natives are looking, wait, you're drinking fire water, you're giving fire water to kids, and you're beating your wives and children, and you think that's okay? And you think we're savages because we don't? And that we bathe every day? Wow, y'all are a trick. I'm just saying. Not that everything, you know, native culture is all fine and dandy. I'm not saying that. Just saying, from a drug prevention point of view, that's why I like to look at culture. Because sometimes you might have to take on a culture that's different. Handsome Lake, you know, oh, we're getting fire water. In fact, there are some chiefs that are saying, no, we are not trading our land for fire water because we don't believe in real estate. You can only own the stuff you make. Did you make the water? Did you make the soil? Uh, no. So you can't own or sell that. Just don't believe in it. It's 
creators. It's a living thing. How do you buy and sell living things? Slavery? What? People are inferior to others because some has a better suntan than others? What? Why wouldn't you have le women leaders be the political leaders and decide who goes to war or not? Why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you let your two spirits, that is, you know, other than heterosexual people be leaders or diplomats or fight in the military? Why not? Why are you tripping? Just saying. Those are questions that come. So that's the well variety movement. That's the culture that came out of it. Seneca, Six Nations, Iroquois Six Nations. Indigenous democracy from 1100. So there was democracy on this continent before Tommy, Jeff, and company. Don't get it twisted. Who's civilized? <laughs> Ain't no pyramids in Europe, yo. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Conscientious is down. It's a Brazilian word that we, a Portuguese word that we don't have a concept for in English, that's why I use it. Uh, Brazilian educator Paulo Freire, conscientiousization or conscientiousization, <laughs> popular education, social concept de developed by uh, Brazilian pedagogue and educational theorist Paulo Freire, which focuses on achieving an in depth understanding of the world, allowing for the perception and exposure of social and political contradictions. This critical consciousness also includes taking action against the oppressive elements of one's life and society that are illumined by the understanding given by conscientious own. So this is the framework that I often use in basically saying, look, this is war, you're a target. And this targeting is like normal. So you got to get hip to the gate. I was taking somebody to detox last year and he said, Wow, you don't seem racist. I go, who said I was racist? My roommate. He saw your show. Because all the classes are televised. And I go, he said, some, I see, he said, he objected to something you said. And I go, what was it? Uh, well, short, long and short of it. What was the reason that you study, especially if you're white, the reason you study black history is because what was once done to us because of race is now being done to you for the money. So you're best to be hip to the game. He said, yeah, that was it. Right, so I'm taking you to detox. How is that racist? <laughs> That's real. Okay, your, your friend is a Navy vet who is drinking a 30 case a night, and you're drinking a fifth of vodka, and you think that's normal behavior. A day. Why do you think that's normal behavior? I'm sorry. Well, what? But hey, critical consciousness. Yeah. Why do you think this is normal? Well, my dad did it. Uh, yeah, and him too. So the idea is you're under attack. You're a target. Normal state of affairs for you to be conditioned to be a consumer, slash slave, slash citizen. Okay. No longer profitable, like within slavery, to like kill the slave. It's easier to make money from stringing the slave out. And that concept has been expanded beyond just slavery. I know that's raw, but there it is. All right? Some might blame the victim, a defective character. It's from the 12-step framework, right? That's the way those people are, those lower class people. Mm, no, I don't think so. So, I'm giving you tools, awareness to fight back and be healthier, to be more contented slave if you want to be, but you probably won't be. So, so now I've given you an opportunity to be aware of your wounding. Um, I inserted this because it was torn from the headlines. I want to make you aware of something that you're probably aware of already. So, Mario Parker Milligan, who was student body president of this institution 
for a couple of years running, just uh, yesterday spoke in D.C. at this national meeting of student leaders and basically denounced the college's use of Higher One. How many people have Higher One cards? Yeah, like the stat is like 80 to 90 percent. Now, because I'm faculty and I have academic freedom, when they were doing this process, I said, before we implement this, we need to do financial literacy and require that of our students before they enter. Because what is the reality? The last time I saw financial literacy or financial awareness, it was in high school. But lots of our students didn't finish high school. We get tons of folks that dropped out of middle school and then, because they're old enough, can take, you know, or maybe got a GED, and boom, now they're college students. So where do you get financial literacy in our society? I notice you're silent. Yeah. Maybe you get it from the bank after there's a problem. Maybe you get it from the credit union if you're a member. I'm just saying, for many people, the student loan is their first loan in their life. And they don't necessarily notice the hidden traps. This is what I'm saying in terms of addiction and addictive practices. It isn't necessary that you're an addict for having a higher one card. I'm just saying you trust the system because of the LCC logo on there. And I'm not doubt dissing the college. I'm just saying we need to educate folks. 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 20 years ago, I said this. A number of us said this. Because there's traps built right in. There's a reason why, and it's not just here, there's a reason why student loan debt exceeds mortgage, whether you complete or not. Because they can make money from it. I ain't against making money. I'm just interested in ethics. What's in the best interest of the consumer? How about that? Is it in the best interest of the country for people to be in debt? I'm thinking not. Don't listen to me. <laughs> I went to school when school cost $150 a term full time, including your books. Not rubbing it in your face. I'm just <laughs> and that was a state institution. Yeah, I know. Right. 150 is the cost of one book. Okay, so to its credit, so what's in quotes, if I bother to do the quote? So former Lane Community College student Mario Parker Milligan took a national stage on Monday to blast his alma mater for outsourcing the job of distributing student financial aid to, to private financial firm Higher One. Now, I will say, this is my opinion, to his credit, the college simply did what colleges usually do when staff are crunched. Okay, we're not getting less and less money from the state. What happens is, you know, the cost of insuring your staff members goes up. So it's people who cost. And if the state's cutting back on your money, uh, more and more of us are having to do more and more job things without being compensated for it. Or you have to cut back on people and do the same job with the money that you get from the state. So it's, yeah, we're the, in between the rock and the hard place. So naturally, the rock and the hard place gets passed on to you, too. So that's why I was saying we need to educate students on financial literacy just so they know the trap before they walk into it and can avoid it. So this is from the article, the collusion between college and New Haven, Connecticut based firm, he said, results in students paying higher banking fees, more student loan debt, and a sense of betrayal. And the betrayal comes LCC logo. And here's what he did, what he found out. So they also, of course, uh, quoted Helen Faith. Students are informed that higher one charges students debit swipe fees in some instances, and additional fees when students use non-company ATMs to get a hold of their student aid dollars. Now, 
understand these are federal dollars tasked for the purpose of educational support. Why are these folks allowed to take money for not benefiting you financially or not educating you about financial literacy? Just straight profit is a question that could be asked. How is that legal? Well, oh, oh, deregulation. They don't have to. They can make money. The pitch. An easy way to access your financial aid, he said. I thought this is a pretty cool idea. Students technically, of course, have a choice of using Hire One or using Hire One deposit their money into the student's own bank or credit union account. Money is dispersed in the company's account instantly. Students have to wait a number of days for Hire One to move the money into their own bank account. Again, there's laws around that. Why not instantly? Give it to me as soon as you get it. Pass it on. Hmm. 80 to 90% of students choose the Hire One route. So, although Mario had his own bank account as an LCC student, he said the higher one option sounded an easier, more efficient way to keep track of his loans and grants, so he signed up. Because it had the college logo on it, I trusted the account was serving my interests. Now, LCC might be serving your interests, but higher one is not LCC. Seems like a no-brainer, right? But you trust without necessarily thinking. Not making this not doesn't make you stupid, right? But you should be suspicious of these folks. But he became acquainted with higher ones assorted fees, which is where the company makes a lot of its profits. So the next term he took his student aid out of the higher one account and deposited it into his own credit union account. Leaving the higher one open. Right? A few months later, he got an overdraft notice from Higher One. He logged into his account and found he was charged a fee for inactivity, and that placed the account in overdraft. Cute. Now, they're allowed to do that. But, wait, did they tell you? Well, it's in the fine print. How many of you read the fine print? Uh, well, right. Okay, well, they count on that. They count on that. That's why I mean financial literacy, being able to read the fine print so you know technically what's going on because that's the trap. So, wow, you got charged for not using the account. You get charged every time you use the account. So it's not like, a, you know, like I, I went to D.C. this weekend. So my U.S. bank account, there are no U.S. banks in Washington, D.C., so I had to use, you know, another ATM, right? So which charged a fee, but my bank refunds the fee back to me. Yeah, well, there's no U.S. banks in D.C., so it's all good with us. We'll take that back because we can make profit on that in retaining you as a good customer, right? Overdraft notes. I couldn't believe it. I chose not to use the account. I was getting penalized for it. The barriers to getting out of higher one continued to mount. My experience wasn't unusual. So the reason I, I went off on this thing in an intro to addictive behavior class is some addictive behaviors come from this level of induced ignorance about how money works. Right? And I can't just simply say, you know, money is like eating a manure sandwich. More bread you have, less manure you eat. That's not instructive about building skill. Sorry, you like to use these earthy issues, but you know what I'm saying, right? Don't want no student complaints about using the S word on camera. <laughs> Children are watching sometimes. No, I've gotten complaints like that. Why are your, your four-year-old watching an addictions class, but okay. So, first boundary. I'm a counselor. I am not your counselor while you're in this class. Okay? Sorry, boundary issues, can't do that. Okay? If we are ever in a counselor-client relationship, I would expect you to work towards becoming your own skilled, best informed consent advocate, to know what the therapist knows, to be able to undertake whatever course of action 
on your own and not be dependent on sessions with me or anybody else. I do believe, I'm a therapist, I do believe in therapy, but I also believe that therapy itself can be an addictive process where you get strung out on stuff that you already know that I'm just calling you on your stuff to say you need to act in this way in your own best interest. And you not. But I, we don't need 10 sessions for you to get that. I'll try and tell you that up front. So, I am a counselor. While you're in class, I cannot counsel you. However, because I am your instructor, I can talk with you about class-related material, particularly if I know that material is going to raise an emotional response in you. Now, I'm not necessarily going to deal with the emotions, but I might say, okay, do this, this, and this to deal with that as part of class instruction. Right? I'm not expecting you to have combat skill as a civilian. You can develop it. I'm, it's basically self-care skill. How do you deal with the wounding? So, in terms of prehab, and I didn't do the prehab that I want to do, maybe I'll think about doing it on Thursday, but it works like this. Prehab is teaching you how to sit still, and then stand as in take a stand once you've learned to sit still. And then to walk, and then to get connected and stay connected. Because basically what happens with addiction is people get disconnected from the source of their source of health. Or they don't even know what health is. There's a saying among my people, it got so bad it got good to them. Like they were used to such a bad situation, they got used to it and just never changed it and got good to it. So they don't even know what good is, and they're scared of good, actually. So, identification of that which makes you strong, that which has heart and meaning, so how to develop your own inner healer, your inner teacher, inner visionary, inner warrior. That's real, one of the reasons I use um, Angie Arian's book. Come to camera. Do a close-up of the book, if you would, please. So the idea with An Angelus Arian is a uh, anthropologist who studied something like 90% of the world's culture and basically distilled some of the wisdom teachings into four, if you will, archetypal roles, warrior, visionary, teacher, and healer. And basically, when her take on addiction is that all addictions are basically like a shadow side. So she's kind of Jungian in that sense, even though Jung's in psychology and she's in, um, yeah, thanks. And she's uh, in anthropology. Um, basically, the shadow side of, addic of each addiction is basically the shadow side of the optimal expression of warrior, healer, teacher, and visionary. Now, as an expo because anthropologists study culture, and one of the things that I basically uh, found in my particular studies, and it's not just my particular studies, it's like, like I said at the beginning, as an ethnic minority in American culture, I'm allowed to have an ethnic culture that's different from America. Like, wow, I'm, you know, it's like Robin Williams said. Cocaine is God's way of saying you're making too much money. Ah, right? And so one of the things that we notice in America is basically people's drug problems often come from excess income, disposable income. I mean, because, yeah, dare. Drugs are really expensive. Right? So one of the things that I've noticed, especially you know, growing up in L.A., you know, look, I'm a musician, I came out of the L.A. music industry, duh, I inhaled. Of course. It's not a prerequisite for doing what I do, but 
people assume just because I'm black that I'm hip and streetwise and you know, look, I'm the son of a doctor and a school teacher, okay? <laughs> That's not exactly a street experience. But I had to know what's up with dealing with certain people, particularly LAPD, but gang members as well. So part of the piece is looking at, hmm, I'm allowed to have a culture, and one of the things that I noticed when I went to school in West LA, you know, Bel Air and Westwood, is not only did I encounter white kids that routinely told their parents to F off to their face, like I couldn't do that. Not that I wanted to, but you know, I couldn't do that. Wow. You get a, and then they give them, you know, thousand dollar a week allowances. So what do you think a kid is going to do with that? Just like what Belushi did when making those <coughs> movies. Okay? Part of every John Belushi movie in Paramount was basically his cocaine budget. But it didn't appear in the line item as a cocaine budget. But, you know, he'd ask for $10,000 to buy a guitar. And it's L.A. You can't, there are $10,000 guitars. So next week, does the accountant ask for the guitar or the receipt? No. So what do you think Ken Grant is going to? And you know he's on crack. And you're letting him do that. Wow. Okay. Cocaine. Oh, so drug problems often come from excess income. So we, pre we predict that. So part of the piece then, looking at that, second boundary. As your inner healer develops, you will be responsible for your own health, truthfully acknowledging whatever conditions you experience, at least to yourself. You can do it to me in a paper if you want. But you're responsible because I can't be your counselor. Okay? So, the healer in Angie's book basically pays attention to what has heart and meaning. Okay, so I'll, get, I'll endeavor to give you in this order the most current empirical science, best practice. So best practice, here's, the, here's what best practice means. Came out of science, of prevention science as well as corporate technology. Best practice means empirically based, replicated longitudinal studies, i.e., they studied a subject for 20 years, then replicated that study again in a new population, 20 years, basically for 20 years, and okay, we got identical results, it's fact. This is where we got the Scandinavian twin studies. What that is, is genetic predisposition for alcoholism. Both replicated in male and female, because the, science, the way we used to do science excluded more than half of the planet's population, i.e. women. It's kind of stupid, but okay. Science was a boys club. They want to study themselves. <laughs> kind of, I don't know. So yeah, you do Scandinavian, so you're studying white men only, like, and so the, basically here, here's was the standard. Gen genetic predisposition for alcohol. It doesn't mean we found an alcoholic gene Here's what we found. Twins who were, whose parents were, whose biological parents were alcoholic, were taken out of those homes, raised in non-alcoholic homes, watch the definition of alcoholic, okay, and tracked to see if they developed alcoholism themselves, greater than norm, whatever the societal norm was. In fact, they did. As 20 year longitudinal study got replicated, boom, we can say there's a genetic component to alcoholism, and then they replicated that same study years later for girl twins. Because, you know, twins come in both flavors, right? So, okay, so now we can say there's a genetic component to alcoholism. We can't say what the alcohol gene is. The best thing we can say is that as long as alcohol has been in your genetic line, you pass on your tolerance and the tolerance of your ancestors to your kids up to the last moment you used and then conceived that child. 
Okay, so what we understand from physics, DNA is a physical molecule, but it basically follows the laws of quantum physics, so it's almost like it's saved all over again every 24 hours. So you drink a fifth of vodka, and then you drink a fifth and a half, then boom, your tolerance is reset to that level. You conceive a kid, that kid gets your tolerance. Doesn't mean the kid will become alcoholic. But it does mean if they do decide to drink and they watch you, they'll drink earlier with less negative physical consequences because you just gave them that genetic tolerance. Now we've proven that with alcohol, there's no reason why it wouldn't be so for other drugs as well, but we haven't done the work because it can't do genetic predisposition studies on an illegal drug. Which is stupid, but okay, that's our drug policy. Yes? Have they done it for prescription drugs? No. That's where they make their money, right? They already give you drug warning. You know, sexual virus, death, heart attack, cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not like they can't do that. Alcoholic that cleaned up and and had kids. Were they still? Were their kids still likely to have that high? No, doesn't. Okay. Yeah, cleaned up is basically a behavioral piece. Mm -hmm. See, understand your nervous system with psychoactive drugs. Your nervous system was designed by evolution to adapt to changing conditions and evolutionary advantage to pass on that knowledge and wisdom, if you will to the next generation. Okay, watch out for this. Now this isn't always conscious. Right? So yeah, if you clean up, fine, but your tolerance remains the same for certain drugs. Permanent, yeah. Unless, you know, okay, take LSD. I'm not saying take LSD. <laughs> for example, LSD. You know, there is no genetic predisposition for like crack cocaine or acid, right? So with LSD, the tolerance, and we'll get into this when I explain, you know, the how pharmacology and all that kind of stuff. The tolerance for LSD disappears with abstinence. Because one, probably the amounts are so small. Okay, I, my friend Bruce, hey Bruce, you know I was going to tell this story if you're watching. Bruce is a drug counselor in our community. He uh, went to my high school. He had my high school's record for the long, at least in the 70s, for the longest consecutive days on LSD in school. 90 and then 120. And he's not an acid burnout. He's actually a very good alcohol and drug therapist. He was a, but his own admission, he was a garbage head. Which meant he'd basically take anything in any combination without regard to what it was. Right? But LSD tolerance disappears with abstinence. It's one of the, only, the few drugs that we know that does that when they've studied it. Cocaine, obviously, yeah, you develop lifelong tolerance. Alcohol, lifelong tolerance. Meth, lifelong tolerance. The nastiest stuff, lifelong tolerance. The nastiest stuff physically. By the way, great questions. Keep them coming. What about marijuana? What about marijuana? Is that lifelong? Probably, yes. We just haven't done studies on it. They have done some people, you know, experientially can experience certain things, you know, which, you know, my experience is. Um, LA music industry, top shelf. It was around when the domestic marijuana industry got created. So part of the piece is like you're genetically engineering strains to become more and more potent so that now as a standard, people are smoking what we used to only experience at, you know, from places like Jamaica and Colombia and Thai stick where it was tropical the plant, you know, just made high THC content, or you only saw that from Afghani hash, 
28%, now you're seeing people start at 28%. So, the natural plant thing, uh, no. Clones, hello, that's not natural. No, you're breeding it for consumer use. So, what do you think is going to happen? So, you didn't ask this exactly, so I'm just going to answer it because it's the question behind the question. Is it an addictive drug? Yes, of course. Makes you feel good. Anything that makes you feel good is an addictive drug. If that wasn't evidence for enough, you know, if you're familiar with Cheech and Chong, it's on iTunes, the weed commercial. No sticks and stems that you don't need. Acapulco gold is badass weed. That was torn from the headlines, okay? Two tobacco companies, Philip Morris and RGR Nabisco, trademarked names for marijuana cigarettes because they expected with the 68 election, Gene McCarthy got elected, then marijuana would be legalized because so many people were smoking it. Nixon got in, boom, we have our current drug laws. Do you think the tobacco companies are going to make, to, com, corporations are conservative. They're about the Benjamins. They're not going to make a move unless they already know what the outcome is going to be in terms of profitability for them. What we know about tobacco is if it wasn't, well, it is addictive, but they make it more addictive because of repeat business. You think they'd sign off on marijuana cigarettes if they didn't know it was either A, addictive, or could be made more addictive? Come on, really? Get serious. So, you know, of course I also do, you know, in terms of looking at, you know, the marijuana quit kit, which I can post on Moodle. Pretty simple, my rule of thumb goes like this. If you don't think it's addictive, Try stopping smoking for six months to a year. And if after the end of six months you actually don't care that you haven't smoked for six months, it's probably not addictive for you. Just get to six months. All right, best practice, longitudinal studies. But obviously because of politics, they don't fund studies for everything. Theoretically, in the research and development process for pharmaceutical drugs, they've done the studies on human subjects, or rats, or you know whatever it is they tested on. So, for example, what I refer to, what is referred to as the LD50, the lethal dose for 50% of whatever you tested it on, rats, and you know, then they basically say, okay, this is going to be the lethal dose for humans extrapolate for that. So the lethal dose for LSD was found from an elephant. Three grams of pure LSD killed an elephant. Elephant died in an hour and a half of a heart attack. Now, they gave the elephant the dose based on its body weight instead of its brain size. So that's 15,000 human doses, assuming 150 micrograms is a, it's not a sea god dose, but yeah, you definitely see it in trailers and all the other kind of stuff at 150 mics. Right? So a gram of pure LSD is basically 6,000 human doses at using that same thing. So that's what they figure the fatal dose for a human is. A gram of pure LSD. Well, you're not getting a gram of pure LSD unless you're an LSD cook. Because how many people are going to eat a hundred sheets of acid? Sheets of blotter paper. How many people are going to do that? Uh, not that many. Right? So that's best practice. Community-defined evidence. So certain communities have studied on their own the effect of certain things. All right? So as an example, Technically, racism doesn't exist according to the American Psychological Association. It has no psychological or emotional impact according to the APA. I'm just saying, black social scientists, of which I'm one, and I was raised by one, say, okay, black people might self-medicate with substances 
because of being called this, that, or the other. They might have some emotional feelings, and they have, you might expect to find higher rates of alcoholism, tobacco, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we deal with that? That's community-defined evidence. We're studying this even if the mainstream ain't. Right? And this is what our prevention is going to look like. And then institutional, intuitional improvisation is you or me saying, OK, I don't know if this works, but I'll try it. Don't try this at home, kids. Got examples of that, but later. OK, so ask the next question. Theodore Sturgeon had a, there was a, um, a bookstore in Eugene in the 70s that had this, actually sold this little logo as a medallion. It simply, it means a, it's a cue with an arrow in it. Ask the next question. Of course, the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. So he says, you know, so I say, question authority, ask hard questions. Find your own answers to those hard questions and answer them and then test them in the real world and also test them on authority to see if they'll ask, they'll answer it. They have the answer. So anybody can do anything he wants if he wants to do it badly enough. You have to study your field and have to find out how other people do it and you have to keep working and learning and practicing and ultimately you will be able to do it. So remember, this field, the addictions field, was basically created by addicts and alcoholics who had some natural organic brain damage from what they use and the system is designed, the addiction treatment system was designed for them, by them, to work at a minimal level, generic level for everybody. Now, there's room for improvement. If you got more of your brain functioning than an alcohol, a 30-year alcoholic, you can do some things. I'm just saying. There's room for improvement, and you could be the improvement. <coughs> okay? So, we're assisting you with this class to help you develop health literacy. And health literacy usually is thought of physical health literacy, but I'm saying there are a bunch of dimensions to that. Financial health, physical health, spiritual health, mental health, etc. So, for example, health literacy. Defined as a cap the capacity of an individual or group to create, obtain, interpret, understand, and utilize basic health information and services, and to use such information and services as well as practice what is optimally healthy for you. So when we talk about literacy, we usually think about like print literacy. But street wisdom is being able to read a situation from very subtle clues. That's a form of literacy too. Or cultural literacy. Now, the potheads are different than junkies, which are different than meth heads, which are different than gambling or sex addicts, which are different than... Right? So those subtle differences can be read, taught, and understood. Okay? So, for example, <coughs> like the song that basically introduces the class, uh, it's called Enough is Enough. So it's the practice of health is the practice of just enough. Well, not just moderation, though that's a good goal. You have to understand what moderation is, how it's defined. Okay, here's the problem with moderation. There's no definition. There's no numbers to it. And those numbers don't translate into an actual health practice. It ain't moderation. Case in point. I hope he's doing well. But my predecessor 20 years ago relapsed in place while he was doing my job. Okay? He was a prescription opiate addict and had a bicycle accident, got scripted with the opiates, and relapsed. 
spectacularly. Moderation, what is that? So what I found when I got the job is that people were coming drunk to work, and by people, I don't mean students, though that was happening too, but faculty. Now, should we make a different policy for a drunken English poet or a cook who soused? No, we should not. Okay, the basic policy, because what I wanted was, I'm a, I'm a treatment person, I wanted the treatment rules. Okay, like abstinence, <laughs> like K-12. Like, how many of you are parents with kids in the K-12 system? Okay, the rules for K-12 set by the feds, zero use by anybody on school grounds or within 1,000 feet of a school, period. End of discussion. That's what I wanted. Oh, well, we have a culinary program, Mark. We can't do that. Okay. Whatever. So the federal boilerplate policy says, thou shalt not use street drugs and thou shalt not abuse alcohol, but did not use the federal policy, mind you, did not use the medically defined standard for what constitutes abuse of alcohol. They didn't even have a blood alcohol level, which says, okay, this is beyond abuse. Like, does it make sense to you? Like, I, this is a rhetorical question because I know what you're going to answer because, student, before you've answered it. If you're too drunk to drive a car, should you be in front of a classroom? <laughs> Will that constitute abuse? Sure. And what level? Should it be 0 0.08, 0 0.04? No. <laughs> Abstinence. And we ain't making different rules for drunken poets or cooks. Abstinence during work hours. That's what I want. No, we can't do that. Okay, fine. Here's our alcohol chart, which you will see, part of the class. You cannot exceed legally drunk. Here's a handy dandy chart. So no, you can't go to Mozzie's, have a carafe of wine and come back to work. You'll be too loaded. I don't care whether a student notices you or not. Professional standards. So, moderation. You know, there are still docs that say to pregnant women that it's okay to drink in moderation while during pregnancy. No. The science says there is no safe dose of alcohol during pregnancy, period. And what's moderation to an American? <laughs> By the way, well, 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 let's use the medically defined definition of moderation. So if you're female, one dose of alcohol a day. If you're male, two doses of alcohol a day. That's moderation. What's a dose? Ah, good. See? Not a stupid question. Very good. A dose is either a shot, a 12-ounce can of 2 to 3% beer, or a four to five ounce glass of table wine, non-fortified. Each one of those is one dose. Now, that dose is applied to your body weight because alcohol intoxication is a dose to weight relationship. Okay, because what is it? Blood alcohol level. So it's based on the amount of blood you have, not your weight. Okay, so we use, in that case, the insurance company actuarial. Okay, you're a certain height. This is supposed to be your ideal body weight. This is the amount of blood you have. Boom. So it's based on that. So like, I'm 40 pounds overweight, which triggered diabetes. I can't drink more because I'm 205 pounds. The dose has to be calculated on 175. That's the ideal weight, theoretically, right? In terms of living length, lifelong, et cetera, et cetera. No, you can't drink more if you gain weight. 
It's about blood. That's the scientific fact, right? But they don't teach that. Right? So moderation is one, two, two doses. And if you exceed those doses, that ain't moderation no more. Okay? So if you get people who think, who have been trained by the industry, sorry to be that blunt, but that's what it is, trained by the industry to think of a dose as the container, when the industry sells quarts, half gallons, as the container, okay, I'm not in recovery, I've been to a brew pub. Do you know what it takes to get them to sell you a 12 ounce glass of beer? No, they're pushing pints. Okay, and they're pushing pints of at least 5% to 9%, or if it's a barley wine style, wine style beer, 12% of beer, which means that in a pint, that's two doses. But you think it's only a glass instead of two doses. Legally drunk for me is four doses. What's moderation? For me, I'm not in recovery, but I am a, I consider myself a first responder, so I don't ever exceed 0.04. Because I'm also from LA, I don't trust people. And I certainly don't leave my, my health and well-being in the hands of strangers if those strangers are intoxicated. Okay, so if you get drunk so that you have a blackout, you are putting your health and well-being in the hands of strangers who may not have your best interest at heart. Just saying. Why are you trusting them? Maybe I'm paranoid. Just maybe I've seen other things. So, balance rather than an indulgence. So, notice that definition of moderation. Okay? So, moderation in big pharma, in pharmaceuticals is following the recommended dose that's on the bottle for your prescription and not exceeding it. That would be moderation. Okay, balance rather than indulgence. Enough is enough. More than enough is clutter or indulgence. So to teach you that balance, I give you a series of exercises which are internal strength building exercises cleverly disguised as assignments. The social recon, the food mood diary, how I spent my week, give it up, hmm, things that make you go, hmm. So, in addition, you can do an extra credit research paper on any relevant topic on your own that you're interested in. Ah, uh, keep it under t 10 pages, double space. Copy that, five minutes. Wow, moving right along. Okay, specific outcomes, we can kind of skip that because that's in the syllabus, required course text, we've done that. Suggested readings, Andy Weil, Addictive Organization by Ann Wilson Shelf. This is also in the um, syllabus already. Work addiction, so I'm just mentioning these because basically just to show you how the field has gone beyond substance abuse. Uh, your Money or Your Life by Dominguez and Robin is still a classic text on financial literacy. It's not required for the class, but I don't, I, I definitely suggest you get it and follow the exercise that are in that. Okay, so class evaluation, in other words, your grade based on a percentage of 270 total points demonstrated understanding the material through either the midterm and final examination, extra credit research, and any of the writings that you do. Uh, this is college. I expect better than best guess or spell check spelling. But I'm not going to downgrade you for such spelling errors, though, you know, I could. I ain't gonna. You turn it in, you turn it in. Try to do the best. Try to exceed the standard I just gave. 
don't let a computer tell you what the wrong word is. That's spell check spelling. All right, and uh, let's see, we'll probably run out of time, so I'll explain what those, those are in detail. Social recon, uh, start week one, do the end of week two, food mood diary, start week three, do the end of week four, how I spent my week diary, start week five, do end of week six, things that make me go, hmm, start week seven, do the end of that week. probably week eight, but that week. So it'd be nice if you'd eliminated or lessened the over amount of addiction or in your life and surroundings, but that's not for me to evaluate. So addictive behaviors to watch out for, broadly speaking. Ingestive addictions, this is from a substance abuse uh, point of view. Ingestive addictions are things you take into your body. So alcohol and other drugs and food. Okay, this is part of the food mood diary. This is what, for example, as a black Indian, I basically say the southern diet is oppression food. Okay, fried everything, heavy in sugar and salt, basically inducing diabetes. Our traditional diet did not include pork in Africa, right? So fried everything in pork, oppression food. Native Americans given high sugar, high salt, content food, junk food, so-called comfort food. These are all addictive substances, sugar and salt in particular. They're no longer targeted to just black people. Though. Oh, yeah, it's beyond that. Yeah, I'm just saying. That's why I'm talking about the cultural dimension. So, ingestive and process, things you do with your body. Gambling, internet use, excessive texting, blah de blah de blah Too much exercising, all that. So, poly addictions, which is not addiction to plastic or parrots, or plastic parrots. It's combinations of things you do with your body and things you take into your body. For example, like, Casinos generate poly addiction because there are no clocks, there's no windows. No. Food and booze is cheap, and you know, convenient use of ATM cards so you can just feed it without even physically looking at the cash. So it's designed to separate you from your money. Basically, you should gamble with money you have to throw away. You ain't got no money to throw away? Don't gamble. Don't gamble with your hire, hire one card in an attempt to make more money. <laughs> Don't try and deal drugs with your financial aid in an attempt to make more money. I'm just raising this because this has happened. See you t Thursday. online.